right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the CNE Sales Monthly Webinar Series. I'm Jeff Butler, the Technical Manager here. And today's webinar is titled IOLink Simple Sophistication. We'll focus on the benefits of IOLink technology. Our presenter today is Scott Henry, one of our automation specialists here at CNE. He's been with us for 17 years. He holds a BSWT from Purdue. And he's a certified Siemens automation engineer. And he spent his entire career working with the Siemens products. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them using the control panel tool on the right side of your screen, and we'll address them at the end of the session. If you don't see that tool, click on the red horizontal arrow, and it should open up that control panel for you. Everyone who's registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording. Oh, if you can't take notes or you have to step away for a minute, you'll be able to come back and review the recording at a later time. Please be sure to attend next month's webinar, hosted by Jay Swank of CNE Sales. His topic will be, are you over-accessorizing your G120 variable frequency drive? This webinar will be hosted on August 9th at 10.30. I'll now turn today's webinar over to Scott. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. And uh, as Jeff said today, uh, we're going to be talking about IO-Link. And uh, we'll get started. So um, what is IO-Link? Um, IO-Link is a serial bidirectional point-to-point -point protocol. And it allows not only IO communication, IO data communication, but also parameterization and diagnostics data to be transferred between the sensor and the master. So notice that it's not a network, it's actually a point-to-point -point communication link, okay? So in addition to signal transmission, we also uh, transfer energy or power supply for the sensor or actuator. IO-Link conforms to, or the standard that IO-Link conforms to is um, IEC 61131-9. And IOLINK Consortium manages the development and the maintenance of the IOLINK protocol. Currently, um, over 161 companies are uh, part of the IOLINK Consortium. And over on the right hand side, you can see a lot of the different vendors, or sorry, different companies that are a part of IOLINK. Um, a lot of them, a lot of major companies in that list there. So it's accepted worldwide. And if you want a little bit of uh, information about IO Link, you can go to io-link.com and uh, they have a whole, uh, several pages full of uh, important information on that website. One thing to note is that uh, IO Link is expanding. Um, they have a little bit of information on their website about this, but um, uh, coming soon will be IO link safety and also wireless. So it looks like the products haven't been released yet, but they're working on it. All right. So let's take a look at the system components of IO link. The most important system component is the IO link master. And there are masters out there that support from one to eight IO link devices. More commonly out there in the market is we see masters that have four or eight ports. Okay, and again, one port on the master is connected to one IO link device. Again, it is a point to point protocol. Um, also important and uh, also an important IO link system component is um, the IO link devices. For the most part, most of the IO link devices are sensors, but there's also RFID readers, valves, motor starters, and IO modules. A lot of times they call these IO link hubs. We have a few examples of those in this uh, presentation. Um, another important component is the cable. Uh, all you really need for IO link is an unshielded three conductor cable. Um, some devices require you to use a five conductor cable. We'll get into that here in a little bit as well. Another important component is the IODD file or IO device description file. This file is generated by the vendor of the device and is typically published on their website. 
Um, the nice thing about IO Link and the IO Link Consortium is they also have a repository of IODD files on their website. And to be quite honest with you, I found that that repository on the IO Link website is a whole lot easier to get the IO Link file or IODD files than trying to traverse through some of the vendors' websites. So a uh, little bit easier access there. And then finally, um, typically all of the IO Link masters have an engineering tool for configuring and assigning parameters of IO Link. So Turk, you can do you can configure their IO Link masters either through the web server that's built onto the master, or they actually have a tool called Pactware um, to configure the parameters of IO Link. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. So on the bottom half of the slide, we have um, a sample of an IO Link configuration. In the upper left here, we have a processor, which actually happens to be an Allen Bradley Compact Logics processor. Out of the Ethernet port, we're going to a Turk TBIN S IO Link Master. It has four ports, uh, four IO Link Master ports on it. Um, out of one of the ports, we're going through a Turk uh, inductive coupler to a Turk um, IO Link hub. It's a 16 um, 16 point hub that can either all those points can either be inputs or outputs. Um, also, out of the Ethernet port of the Compact Logics processor, we're going into a multi protocol BL67 Turk gateway, and attached to that gateway is an IO Link master. Again, it has four ports on it going to a Turk temperature switch sensor or a banner Q4X laser um, sensor or also one of the ports is going to a Siemens two port um, IO block. So that gives you an idea, hopefully it gives you an idea of the topologies that we can achieve with IO link. All right, so let's focus on cabling right now. As I mentioned before, all we really need to cable uh, as far as cable is concerned to go from the sensor to the IO link master is a free wire cable. Um, it can be unshielded. Preferably you do shielded cable, um, especially in high noise and in industrial environments. Again, we're talking about a sync, uh, serial link here. It is pretty robust, but again, we want to take appropriate measures to keep noise um, out of the, um, the signal uh, cable. Um, again, standard I.O. technology, um, if you have an I.O. link master with M12 connectors on it, use a standard M12 connector. There's nothing special about that. Um, the pin assignment um, and the wiring color uh, corresponds to IEC 609-74-5-2. So we use standard colors on the wires and standard uh, pinouts there too, pin one for 24 volts, which is brown. Pin three is zero volts, which is blue. Pin four is the uh, actual IO communication wire, and that's typically black, okay? Um, IO link masters usually have, if they're an IP67, 65 rated master, um, usually the master is a five pin M12. Sensors are typically four pin M12, Actually, actuators are um, usually five pin M12 connectors, okay? The maximum amount of current we can transfer over the power pins for IO link is 200 milliamps, all right? So there's two different port types on IO link. For the most part, everything's pretty much uh, port class A or type A port types, which we have again, um, our power on pins one and three. And then on pin four, we have our IO link um, channel, our wire. And then it's not defined by the IO link spec, but sometimes what manufacturers do is they use pin two for an additional digital input. The second uh, port type is a port class B or type B port. And the only difference between a type A and a type B is um, on pins two and five, they use that for the, an additional power supply. 
So this is typically used more for valves and um, devices that require an extra supply. In regards to data transmission, um, the cyclic data transfer between the device and master is about uh, 400 microseconds, so it's pretty fast. Um, the thing to remember about IO-Link is in addition to passing data for the IO, we can also pass uh, configuration and parameterization and diagnostic data without having an impact on the process data uh, speed. Um, the communication is based on 24 volts. And as I mentioned before, it's a very robust communication protocol. Um, if a transmission fails, the frame is repeated two more times and then only after the second retry does the IO-Link master recognize a communication failure and signal this to um, a higher level controller. Communication between the master can occur in uh, three different baud rates, um, 4.8K, 38.4, and 230.4K um, baud. Um, typically, um, IO-Link specification version 1.0 the devices can only communicate in 4.8 and 38.4K. Um, version point, uh, version 1.1 uh, devices can communicate to up to 230.4K baud, uh, baud rate. A device only supports one communication baud rate or transmission rate, and the master can, if it's a version 1.1 master, it can automatically go out and detect that baud rate and um, set its own transmission rate accordingly. Also with version 1.1, we have the ability to automatically reprogramming of the sensors. So there's a setting in the master to be able to do that, but if you wanna replace sensors and you don't wanna go out and reprogram it, um, the master has the ability to go out to the sensor or the device and pull in all the parameters and then when it sees a brand new device out there it can actually transmit that parameter list back down to the new device so you don't have to go out and program it that has to be set up in the master there's a few settings that you have to take care of for that but uh, version 1.1 devices you have to have both a master and a uh, device of iolink version 1.1 to be able to do that all right, so we have two types of data transmission. We have the cyclic or the process data. And the process data is typically two bytes, but can be anywhere from zero to 32 bytes. Um, we also transmit value status in the cyclic data channel. They also call that a port qualifier. And it indicates whether the process data is valid or invalid, okay? So typically we see people using the cyclic process data exclusively. Uh, another type of data is the acyclic data, and that's where the parameters and diagnostic data get transferred. So typically with acyclic data, you need uh, function blocks if you're working with the Siemens PLC or AOIs to be able to pull that data out of the IO-Link device. And um, it's done based on a request of the master and not part of the cyclic channel, okay? Most people use the cyclic and or everybody that uses IO-Link, of course, uses the process data channel. Um, and most people use that only. There's very few people that use the acyclic, but it's available if you need it, okay? So again, acyclic data, we transfer parameters um, ID data, diagnostic information, and error information, okay? So um, the next thing we're going to look at is the IODD file. Uh, the IODD file, again, is available, uh, should be typically available on the manufacturer's website, but also can be available on the IO-Link website as well. Um, it's a XML file, and we'll look at that here in a little bit. Um, the IODD file defines the communication properties, device parameters, and data with value range and default data. 
The device parameters are organized. Uh, sorry, the device parameters are organized by index and sub-index, and can also and can be accessed via manufacturer's IO-Link config tool or logic instructions in the program. So we'll get to that here in a little bit. We've got some AOIs and function blocks to show you to be able to access some of those parameters. It also contains identification data, process and diagnostic data, a text description, um, a little graphic of the device, and also the logo of the manufacturer. Again, IO link or IODD files are typically available on the device vendor's website, but also can be available on the io-link.com site as well. They've got a nice repository of quite a few IODD files. The structure of the IODD file is the same for all device devices of all manufacturers, and it's always represented in the same way. Um, so you could use any um, IO Link master um, config tool and pull that file in, and it looks the same no matter what IO Link uh, master tool you're looking at. Okay. So here's an example of an XML file. It's the IODD file of a Turk um, LE 550 uh, laser sensor. So um, this structure of the IODD file has to conform with a um, with the IO Link specification. Um, on their website, they actually have an IODD file checker tool. So um, Vendors can use that to check their IO link files. And then also end users can use to check that file and see if there's any errors. Um, maybe somebody went in and inadvertently changed something or deleted something. So um, it goes through and checks the file. All right. So this kind of format format is not real user friendly to look at. And what some manufacturers like Banner have done is they actually have put that uh, IODD file and converted that to an HTML file. So this is a whole lot better to look at than, um, you know, the previous slide here, an XML file. Um, some people are able to read XML files and that's fine, but um, Banner has put it in a, a pretty nice format for you to be able to read it. So some of the things that we see here are the vendor ID and vendor name, um, also given a device ID and device family. Some of the features of the IO Link uh, device are specified in this section here. Um, the standard that the IO Link device corresponds to, the transmission rate that it talks, the minimum cycle time, which is 2.3 milliseconds, and some of the other um, IO Link modes and settings can be seen here. We've got an icon of the device, and then also in this IO Link file, uh, we can see um, that they've given you the pinouts, which is kind of nice. This is a section of the um, IODD file, which describes the process data. And every IO-Link device has process data. Um, as I mentioned before, most devices are 16 bits or two bytes. This one happens to be a 32 bit or four byte process data area. So we can see we have three bits down at the beginning of the, the um, process data area, which indicate the output state of, uh, there's two uh, channels of output state there. And then it also indicates the stability um, of the measurement value and then the measurement value itself. So um, in a Siemens PLC, normally we would shift out these three bits if we were using the measurement value. Um, Maybe in an Allen Bradley PLC, you would use a bit field distribute command um, to grab out the only the process data and leave the bits um, alone. So um, not a difficult way of dealing with the process data. All right, and as I mentioned before, if you only wanna use process data, you can use that. Um, all by itself and not use the AOIs and function blocks to get the acyclic data, such as the parameters and so on and so forth, okay? So this is an example of the acyclic parameter data. Um, as you can see here, um, we have one 
ch uh, channel one output state. So we have one output and we can program a min value and a max value for that channel one output. So we have a set point one and a set point two. So here we would need the AOIs or function blocks, depending on the vendor of the PLC that you're using to send data or parameterize these two parameters. Okay. So each parameter has an index number and then they also have a sub index number. And this is how you, this is what you would reference when you were using the AOIs and the function blocks and, and setting these values here. Okay. So let's look at the tools a little bit and we're going to look at Turk today and we're going to also look at Siemens. Um, so once we get the IODD files off the vendor's website or off the IO link website, we need to import them into the tools. Okay. Turk's method of importing them is their IODD DTM configurator. So I would place the IODD file in a folder on my desktop or on a folder on my hard drive. And then I would go up to the add IODD file uh, button in the upper right hand corner of the software. And I would press that and then that would allow me to browse to the location of that IODD file. And then you hit OK and then it imports it into the IODD DTM configure and then also the Pactware software, which is what we use to configure the actual IO device itself. So this is nothing more than an import tool. It's actually free of charge, excuse me, free of charge. And you can get that off of Turk's website and um, all your uh, CNE sales automation specialists should uh, be able to direct you to that place. The next tool that we're able to use is the Turk uh, service tool. And what the Turk service tool is, is used to go and browse your network and find all your Turk and uh, um, Alan Bradley devices. Um, it's used primarily to set the IP address um, of the Turk devices, but it's also a way of accessing the Turk web servers. So we have two ways that we can configure IO-Link devices and IO-Link masters. It's either through the Turk Pactware software or all of Turk's uh, IO-Link masters have a web server on it. And we can use that web server to configure those, that master and the devices as well. Okay. So we're going to show you slides of both methods here. So this is the Pactware software. The Pactware software is available on the Turk website free of charge, just like the Turk service tool and the IODD DTM configurator. And uh, what we see here is um, a configuration, we see a TBIN S2 IO link master, and we see all of the IO link devices that are attached to that master. So for example, here we have a Q4X uh, laser sensor, a, um, a Turk um, LE550 laser sensor on port two, and the 16 port um, IO link hub from Turk on port three and then a K50 lamp on port four. And right now selected is the IO master itself. And we can see all the different settings there we can change. Um, for example, the TBIN S2 is actually a multi-protocol. So not only does it support Modbus TCP, but it can also support ethernet IP and Profinet on the same block. So you don't need three different part numbers uh, to support three different protocols. It's one port, uh, part number to support all those protocols. Um, I can set up some network connection uh, things here. And then also, um, depending on the uh, protocol, do I want um, control and status words, quick connect, and so on and so forth. So that's part of the gateway or the um, IO master setup there for communications. Then I go down to the IO link part of it itself. And here's where I set up each port. Each port I can set up, um, I can turn on and off the IO link um, data storage mode. So earlier we talked about being able to load the parameters out of the sensor and store it in the IO link master. We can do that. 
um, with this setting here, the data storage mode. We can also set up the cycle time and um, some other things and the mapping. Um, certain PLCs, they like to swap the bytes or the words. So we can set it up um, in the master here if we want to um, and not have to set it up in the PLCs. Okay. In addition, this tool, we can also um, look at actual values coming out of the IO link sensors. So we can do some diagnostic, look at some diagnostic information as well. All right. So we're getting down to the channel level. And in the channel level, we can set all kinds of different parameters, such as set points for the outputs. Some sensors have digital outputs on the pins, so we can set those. Um, delays um, for those digital outputs. Uh, here in the menu here, we can look at process data and look at all kinds of um, good information. So this could really be used as a good troubleshooting tool as well as a setup tool. Okay, so in addition to the Pactware software, um, Turk, all the Turk um, IO blocks have web servers on them and we can do set up and look at some information um, via the web server as well. So basically a duplication of what we saw back here in the channel setup in Pactware. Okay. So kind of convenient. So as far as the Allen Bradley PLC, a very simple setup. Um, uh, Turk has provided um, EDS files for you to be able to download for free off of their website. Okay, so um, if you need help getting directed to that, you can contact uh, us at CNE Sales or one of your automation specialists, and we'll be happy to direct you to that place on the website. So here is an example of the module property setup. So I'm setting the IP address, giving it a name, um, using assembly instance 103 and 104. And then also kind of as an option, um, we have a configuration instance of um, 84 um, bytes here. And um, that is an option. So if you're setting up the IOLink master and the IOLink sensors via the web server or the Pactware software, you don't want to use this configuration. You want to set these both to zero. If you want to set up the IOLink master and the sensors um, via the configuration instance, we would, of course, put this configuration at 106 and 84 bytes. Okay. The thing to remember is if I do decide to use the configuration via the PLC, when I fire up the PLC, when I go from a stop to run state on the PLC, it's going to actually write the configuration from the settings I have here, my configuration instance, down to the master. So it will overwrite anything that I set up in Pactware or on the web server. So I have to be careful of that. All right. All right. So Turk has provided us and the customers with some AOIs to use with their IO link masters. And these AOIs are used to change parameters via indexes and sub-indexes. So they have a read integer data block, a write integer data, read string data, write string data blocks for you to be able to use to change the parameters. And uh, if you need it, we have some sample projects for you to be able to look at and also some pretty good documentation on how to use these AOIs. Going to the Siemens uh, PLCs, Siemens has a similar tool, configuration tool, called the PCT. And in that uh, configuration tool, we can tell the IO link module what there is in each, uh, on each, attached to each port. So there's a way to import the IODD files into the Siemens PCT tool, and then take and select for each port what's attached to it. So on the Siemens PLC I have here is I have a LTF-12 uh, laser sensor. I have a QS-18 um, sensor. And then also I have a Sirius ACT uh, IO link ID key selector switch there as well. And part of the information that I get once I configure what sensors are attached to each port is the IO addressing gives me that information. 
And then also I can go and se select parameters and change parameters via the Siemens tool as well. So a little bit different layout than the Turk Pactware, but um, with Siemens IO Link Masters, gives me a pretty convenient tool for um, setting the parameters in, in one big list. All right. Then also I can look at um, diagnostics information. So I look at the process data so I can see actual values here. Um, a lot of the sensors actually have a runtime counter so I can see the amount of time that the sensor has been in um, operation. And I can also um, reset a um, runtime counter as well. All right, so a lot of good diagnostic information down to the sensor level is available using these tools. Siemens does things a little bit differently with their IO Link Masters. They actually have an IO Link device block, which kind of takes the place of the Turk read and write block. So Siemens does kind of everything in one block versus Turk has a couple of blocks to do reading and writing of parameters. And then also they have an IO Link Master, which is used to back up and restore device parameters and settings um, of the master and also the devices. All right, so this is a example of the Siemens um, IO Link device block. And in this particular case, we're interfacing with a Siemens uh, Sirius ID key switch. So what the ID key switch in summary does is basically you have a number of keys that actually have a unique hex code for each one. And um, also they have an authorization level. So that key switch and those keys could be used for machine access or HMI access. So it's a kind of neat feature. So if you're interested in that, uh, you might want to contact your CNE salesperson and ask to uh, have uh, the automation specialist come out and give you a demo of that. So um, kind of a different way of um, parameterizing and also getting data out of the device. So we have one block, like I said, for Siemens versus um, a couple blocks for um, Turk and Allen Bradley PLCs, okay? So good way of getting information if you need it. So let's look at uh, the Turk IOLink master products that are available. On the upper left-hand side, we have a BL67 multi-protocol gateway and attached to it, we can attach a four channel IOLink master to it. And you can have a number of different uh, IOLink master cards attached to the BL67. The brother product of the BL67, and the BL67 is the IP6567 rated modular family of uh, Turk IO. Um, the IP20 rated family of Turk IO is the BL20, and they also have um, four channel IO Link master cards. And then if you're looking for more of a block style uh, IO, Turk has a uh, four channel or actually a two-channel IO link uh, master, and it also has safety IO on it. Or if you want, um, down here in the bottom right, we have eight-channel and also four-channel IO link masters on the bottom right and also on the bottom left. All right. So in the upper right-hand corner, again, we have some Turk IO link masters. Typically, those are two channels with some safety I.O. built into it. And um, right now, Turk supports ProfiSafe, which is Siemens, and then they also support SIP Safety, which uh, would be compatible with Rockwell PLCs. All right. So again, I want to emphasize one block supports multiple protocols. On the Siemens side of the fence, Siemens has a number of different I.O. link masters starting with the S7-1200 PLC. They have a four port IO-Link master that attaches to the right of the um, CPU. Um, we we'll also have a ET200SP, which is basically um, modular IO, a four point master for that. And then also a four point master for the older ET200S family. 
And if you're interested in the modular IP67 block style IO, um, Siemens has that as well. So this is the ET200 Pro line in the upper right here with both some standard IO and some safety IO plus some IO link ports there as well. And the um, IO link master there is a four port master. Siemens also has some uh, four port master in the ET200 AL family. And then also in the block style um, IO, they have a four port master. All right, so what are some of the IO link devices that we have available from c &E Sales? Um, quite popular is the IO Hub. So they have different flavors of that. Uh, one of the most popular ones is a 16 DXP. Again, as I mentioned before, those points on the 16 DXP can either be inputs or outputs, and you can configure whether they're inputs or outputs via the packedware software or via the, um, yeah, via the packedware software. We also have proc switches, inductive and ultrasonic switches. Um, another more popular item for IO link is temperature and pressure switches. Um, and then also linear position switches or linear position transducers, I'm sorry. All right. One of the more popular items that Turk has is the inductive coupler. So we're transmitting IO link signals over the air from one side of the coupler to the other side. We're also transmitting power over that inductive coupler air interface. So some of the parameters to watch out for on the when using the inductive coupler is we have a maximum of seven millimeters between the face of one coupler component to the other coupler component. And then also we're allowed a maximum of five millimeter lateral offset. So um, if they don't line up perfectly, that's all right. We allow a little bit of um, misalignment there. And then also one thing that it's important to remember is um, there's a maximum of 500 milliamps, a half an amp of power that can be transferred from one side to the other. So you remember the specification is 200 milliamps but Turk allows a half an amp up to a half an amp to be transmitted over this air interface. And I'm told that they're actually working on a one amp model. So haven't seen that yet, but I'm told that they're working on it. So that's kind of neat. So where this could be used at is maybe if you want to replace a slip ring on a rotary table, it's possible that you could use this to um, replace that. So anywhere where you're transferring parts of a machine in and out of the machine. So if you have maybe dies with sensors on them, um, could be used for that. Um, so we have a number of customers or a few customers using the inductive coupler and they have a couple sensors mounted on the dies itself. And instead of unplugging all the sensors before they remove the die, um, they just use a um, IO link inductive coupler for that solution. So it works out pretty nice. So the next slide is to kind of show you a couple of the solutions. The slide I like the most is down here at the bottom where they're using a multi-port uh, IO link hub. So we can see a number of different sensors connected to the plug. And then over the air interface, we're transmitting power and also IO link sensor back to the IO link um, four port uh, master module on a BL67 here. If you only have one sensor, that's okay as well. Um, the IO link inductive coupler supports single sensors as well. All right, moving over to the banner side of the fence, um, we've got a number of different uh, IO link devices, and with banner, it's growing daily. Um, in some cases, the IO link devices that uh, they're putting out. So some of the more popular ones is the Q4X laser distance center, sensor, um, the LE and LTF laser sensors as well, fiber optic um, photoelectric sensors. Um, the QS18 is pretty popular. And uh, what's really popular right now is the TL50 stack lights and also the K50 um, lights as well. Um, Banner also has support for IO link um, 
light curtains, not safety light curtains, I wanna emphasize that, but easy array standard light curtains, okay? So IO Link does not, or they're working on IO Link safety, but uh, it's not quite done yet, all right? So moving on to the set, uh, Siemens side of the fence as far as IO Link devices, um, we talked about the ID key switch. So again, it's a key switch that mounts in a, in a panel and uh, you have a number of different keys. They're all, they all have different colors and each one of those keys has a certain um, access level or authorization level. And tied to that authorization, you have a number of different positions available on the rotary switch. So if the ID key switch or the key has an authorization level of one, then only one position is available on the key switch. If we have a authorization level of three, then we'll have three levels available on the key switch or three selector positions available on the key switch, okay? So in addition to that, um, using the read and write parameter block, we can actually read out the key ID as well. And it is a, um, a 10 digit or 10 hex digit uh, key ID so you can actually use that to identify operators as well and personnel and limit or give access to machine control based on that ID, all right? So in addition to the key switch, we have um, starters, compact starters and contactors that are able to be controlled over IO Link. So customers that have done IO Link using these starters and contactors have um, significantly reduced their wiring in their panels, and in some cases made their panels a little bit smaller. And uh, also, um, Siemens has some RFID uh, that goes over IO link, and then also overload relays, and then we have a couple flavors of digital input modules over IO link, IO link as well. All right, so getting down to the conclusion of our uh, webinar here today. Um, why IO Link? Again, it's a simple standardized wiring and significantly reduce the variety of interfaces for the sensors. If we go back and look at the interface for an IO Link sensor, it's the same across the board, no matter what vendor you have, okay? So again, we have a standard uniform interface for sensors and actu actuators irrespective of their complexity. Again, no matter whether it's a laser sensor or a um, IO block, the interface is the same. That allows us to reduce the variations in inventory and spare parts that we have to carry. Fast commissioning, again, instead of going and fumbling with a uh, interface on a sensor, you know, that's only got a few buttons and a small display, we can actually commission the device through a piece of commissioning software like the uh, Packware software or the Siemens PCT software. Reduce space requirements. So not only were we reducing um, cable tray um, sizes, again, we're only working with three wires instead of multiple uh, wires here. And where that significant, where you see significant uh, uh, improvements in that is again the use of the IO hubs and the motor starters. So any combination of IO link devices can be attached with non IO link devices on an IO link master. So that's one thing we didn't really cover too much is that each channel on an IO link master can be either an IO link master or it can be just a discrete input and output. And then we can also uh, reduce wiring using, again, IO link hubs. Um, again, the one that's popular with us and Turk is the 16 DXP IO link hub. And again, we see that on a lot of applications, you know, especially coupled with the um, inductive coupler. And really, I see the benefit of this is um, some of the IO link masters and sensors can be used as analog input modules. So that reduces the need of a card on a rack and um, wiring that analog signal all the way back to a analog input card or maybe analog output card 
um, and taking a chance of you know noise getting on that wire, um, we can actually localize the I/O link master and put the master and the signal transmission um, a little bit closer to the sensor itself versus wiring everything back to a main cabinet. All right. So again, um, and then we'll eliminate the special I/O cards and cables and higher precision analog value. So we avoid the D to A and A to D conversions. And some of these sensors, as you noticed, um, we have more bits as far as the resolution is concerned. So if we go back and look at the um, banner uh, LE 550, um, they had 29 bits of analog signal there versus maybe a standard 16 bit on an analog input card. So we can achieve perhaps higher precision with our analog signals by using IO link. Again, consistent communication between sensors and actuators in the controller. Again, with IO link, we have access to all the process data, diagnostic data, and di device information with the vendor's um, IO link configuration tool. And then we have I access to device specific data such as parameters, set points, and things like that. And then also remote diagnostics is supported. Again, IO Link conforms to an open standard, which is IEC 611-31-9. And devices can be integrated in all the same way in all the commonly used field bus systems and automation systems. So it's an open standard. So again, why use IO Link? It's a tool supported parameter assignment. So again, instead of fumbling through um, a small display with only a few buttons and going through a manual, you have a nice user interface to be able to go and set up all those parameters. Consistent diagnostic information, again, using the tool, getting diagnostic information, looking at actual values. Dynamic change of sensor and actuator parameters by the controller or the HMI. So using the acyclic channel of IO link, we can change parameters. And I have a sample uh, project available if you want to look at that um, using a Siemens HMI and a Rockwell PLC. Um, so we can change parameters via HMI via the cyclic channel. And then if we need to replace the device, if the device in the master are IO link version 1.1, then uh, we can set up that master to pull the parameters out of the uh, IO link device. And then if we replace it with a brand new untouched um, IO link device, then the master can send those parameters back down to the device. So we reduce downtimes. Again, you're not out there on the machine fumbling with a small display and some small buttons in a manual trying to uh, uh, figure out what's wrong with that sensor and program that sensor. So that allows you to uh, device replacement by untrained personnel without additional tools. And it prevents you from making incorrect settings if you're changing out a device, okay? So in addition to that, uh, IO Link has some nice um, identification and documentation features. So there are places in the um, set up tools where you can actually give the sensor a name and uh, so you can track and record um, data like how many hours that sensor has been operating, any diagnostic information. So that all that information can all be gathered and pushed into the PLC and pushed up into the HMI or further yet pushed up into uh, data collection systems. So uh, compatible with the Internet of Things and storing data in the cloud. Okay. So um, I'm going to go here and go into a virtual machine here. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a Rockwell virtual machine here and kind of show you a little bit about the IO link parameterization tool. So here's the packedware tool and I have a T-bill um, 16 DXP, again, that's the 16 port IO hub. Um, and I'm gonna double click on that and look at some parameters there. So here we can see uh, we can activate 
um, invert the digital input, activate the output. So on one of the channels here, I've activated the output. Um, look at some diagnostic information as well and set up the channels, whether or not we want that channel on the T-bin IO link master to be an IO link channel or a discrete IO channel. All right. And then also there's some settings with device replacement as well. So I can replace it with a family compatible device, a, a identical device, and also set up the digital input channels as well. Okay. So a number of different things we can do with the packedware tool. And again, if I don't want to set parameters and uh, read parameters, I don't have to. I'm going to go to the Allen Bradley controller tags here and monitor some tags here. And if I actually look at the IO data coming across, I can see some values here and I can take and convert those values from raw number into scaled values in my program with just a little bit of logic. So I really don't need the acyclic channel if I don't want to use it. But just to give you an example of um, what some of that programming looks like, is I actually have a banner um, LTE where I'm writing and reading parameters out of. So again, these example projects are available to you free of charge. If you want to look at them, you can. So here's an example of where I'm bringing in some data from an HMI and um, basically modifying that to a structure that the IO link uh, likes to see it in. And then I'm writing that data. And here I'm writing two set points here. And um, here in this logic here, I'm turning the laser on and off if I need to turn the laser on and off. So I'm writing it to a different index number and also sub index number. All right, so some of the things that you can do with that. If I move over to the Siemens PLC, go into a different VM. Here's the Siemens Somatic PCT. Again, uh, I can go online and look at actual values if I want. So I'm going to go and look at diagnostics. And this particular device is a banner LTF laser distance sensor. So as I move the laser, back and forward to a certain point, which I'm measuring to, I can see the actual value go increase or decrease here. And then also I have a runtime counter and uh, some other information that might be important, okay? And if I wanna go and change parameters in the Siemens, I can go offline with the PCT tool and the sensor and I can change those parameters. Then I go up and download those parameters to the master and then through the master to the device and then go back online with the device and monitor it or do whatever I need to do, okay? So a uh, nice little tool there to be able to maintain the sensor and program the sensor if I want to. So in the Siemens program, I have a function call here and I'm going to get out of my PCT tool here in a second. So I don't want to save the changes here and disconnect from the tool and then go into my program. And here I have my ID key switch block, which is basically used to read the ID. And if I want to look at my HMI screen here, so basically a standard process data, I get the authorization level and the key switch data coming across as inputs. And then as acyclic data, I'm reading the key ID out of that key switch. And then also as a part of the ASIC data, there's a certain key, a white key that I can actually program the authorization level. The color keys come pre-programmed with an authorization level, but the white key, you can program it to each, to whatever in, um, authorization level you want. So I can actually reset that white key to factory and also set that authorization level on that, that key as well. That all happens through this function block in acyclic communications. So a little bit of programming involved, but not much. Um, again, one function block and uh, we're able to use the acyclic um, channel to program 
um, parameters and get information out of that IO link device. So just to give you a, a sample of um, the authorization level, um, I'm going to pull out a key and push in another key. Again, I'm reading just regular digital inputs here on the uh, Siemens PLC. And as you can see, the different bits are changing um, on those di digital inputs. Okay. So again, all these sample programs are available to, to you if you want to, if you're using some Siemens IO-Link masters and um, IO-Link devices, or if you're using a Rockwell PLC and want to use a Turk IO-Link master, maybe some Banner and Turk IO-Link devices, they're available to you free of charge along with a configuration manual for the Turk IO-Link um, AOIs uh, free of charge. So I'm going to go back to my presentation here and um, look at, see if there's any questions so far. And um, let's see here. So having trouble reaching. Did you mention the cable link between limitation? Um, I'm just going to start on the bottom here. All right. Did you mention the cable length limitation between IO link device and master? I think I probably forgot that. <laughs> I'll go back here to the beginning here. The um, maximum cable length um, between the master and the device is 20 meters. Um, I'll go back to that slide. And from current slide there, the maximum cable length is 20 meters. Um, I would take some precautions and use shielded cable, but again, the standard says that you don't have to, but it's probably a good idea to do that. Okay, let's see what the next question is. All right. And hopefully I'll get to all your questions. Um, actuator with end of travel limit switches. So um, I haven't seen any in the products that we sell. Um, but I would imagine that they're out there. Um, Siemens used to sell or still does sell limit switches, but those are discrete devices. And as far as I've seen so far, those are not IO link devices. Okay. So um, I'm sure that they're out there uh, at this point in time. I don't think we have any available. All right. So the next question was, um, Let's see, considering the ban or limit switch early in the presentation, when would you use the discrete output bits of such a device versus using the analog value now readily available with iLink and putting logic in, in the PLC? That's a very good question. Um, you know, again, for some of the analog devices like the LTF and uh, laser sensors. Um, in my opinion, I think it's a better idea just to bring the analog signal in and doing the compares for the limits in the PLC. Um, certainly those outputs are available via IO link from the sensor and setting the set points are, but I guess from the ease of use standpoint, again, doing it in the logic and doing the comparison, the logic for, you know, over limit, under limit, whatever, comparing the signal, uh, in my opinion, would probably be best done in the PLC. And then that way you can have the limit changes via an H HMI. You could also doing that, do that uh, via IO link, again, using the outputs, the two outputs on the sensor, but it seems like it'd be more logic in the PLC to be able to do that. So um, I'm in agreement with you. Probably doing that limit check in PLC logic would probably be easier um, from a programming standpoint, an implement implementation standpoint. Okay. And um, pardon me, I'm kind of hesitating here a little bit because um, the display here is a little bit crunched up, so I can't see the questions too well. Um, so the next question is, how does cost of an IO link device and associated master compare with an equal network device, um, Profinet or Ethernet IP? Um, haven't really done a cost comparison of that. Um, I think maybe IO link may be more of a convenience issue in certain cases. 
um, solving applications, maybe versus cost. Of course, maybe um, wiring back to an IO card and paying for an electrician to do all that wiring. You have to factor that in too when you're using discrete cards too. So um, if you're using a Ethernet IP IO block, um, what's the cost of your cord sets? Um, you know, pulling an Ethernet connector or a cable out there and so on and so forth. So haven't really done the cost comparison comparisons of IO blocks but um, I do know that there's significant time and cost savings when you're using, for example, the Siemens um, uh, IO Link motor starters, and when you're using the Turk um, IO Link hub. So you're doing a lot of savings in wiring there um, and time and both money uh, there. So a um, little bit of savings there. Um, again, I haven't done cost comparisons um, in regards to um, IO blocks and analog cards versus IO link cards and so on and so forth. I do have some customers that actually have, have you know, gotten, in a, gotten themselves out of a pinch. Hey, I don't have any, any more space in my IO rack. Um, you know, I want the diagnostics capability of the sensor. Uh, I, well, I, I like IO Link and the programmability, uh, the, the versatility and the programmability that that gives me. I'm just going to go ahead and implement an IO Link solution instead of wiring everything back to an analog card. So um, um, those customers choose that. Again, the one uh, customer, they were actually using the IO Link um, inductive coupler in an IO Link hub for um, transmitting signals from sensors on a um, a die in a press. So um, not to be used for safety, we want to emphasize that, but they want to know if uh, the die is in certain positions. So um, they transmit those signals back to the PLC versus that method. So, all right. So I'm going to go and see if there's any more um, questions. What would be the amperage for high amperage valves? Sorry if it's already covered. That's okay. Um, the limit per channel on IO link, um, and this is part of the standard, is 200 milliamps. So we can't really go over that. There are some valves out there that actually um, can operate off of that little current, but um, I would say smaller valves, maybe air valves, but um, large valves, probably IO link is not your solution unless you use some sort of interposing relay or some some sort of intermediate device to transfer from the low power to the um, high power. Okay, so again, 200 milliamps is your limit out of the IO link master port. Can't go above that. Um, I'm not sure if they're working on a standard which would allow higher levels of current, but um, for right now it's 200 milliamps. Another question is what would be the total actual response time for an analog transistor to the PLC. I saw 400 microseconds for a device master cycle time, but curious about the total time. Um, I haven't really tested that. Um, some of the settings in the IO link masters for the sensors, um, I think one of the specs for the um, LE 550, let me see if I can try to go to that slide here as fast as I can. Um, looking at the specs for the LE550, trying to get to that here in a second. Yeah, so looking at the specs of the LE550, the minimum cycle time or the fastest this can update at is 2.3 milliseconds. So it varies from sensor to sensor, um, the IO update rate. Some sensors have a faster uh, update rate. I believe I looked at one sensor and it was, um, around 1.3, 1.2 milliseconds was the minimum cycle time it could go, okay? So um, the masters itself, you know, they can go up to 400 microseconds cycle time, but it's really dictated by the IO link device itself and the specs of that device, all right? 
What's the opacity of the IO link discrete IO blocks you mentioned? Um, I'll have to look at that. Um, it's not very much. I think it's like 100 milliamps. Um, if you email me um, or email c &E sales or contact your sales guys, we can get that information for you. But I believe it's less than 100 milliamps. It's not very much. Again, you're working with that um, 200 milliamp uh, current limit there for each port on the IO-Link master. So you can't go over that. All right. All right. So that looks like the um, last question. So I'm going to go to the end of the slides. So if you have further questions or want to see an IO-Link demo, um, contact your local c &E sales representative. We'd be happy to come out and show you all the different products that we have. Here's a list of all the automation specialists in the territory with phone numbers. So if you have any questions, you might want to take a screen grab of that and email us or call us. Be happy to contact you. And then, um, like I said, if you want a on-site demo, just contact your CE &E sales representative and we can schedule an automation specialist to come out and talk with you and look at your application, see what's best for you. So um, if there's no more questions, thank you for attending and uh, uh, have a good day. All right, Scott, thank you very much. Thank you all for attending and thank you for the questions. And Please uh, remember to join us next month on August 9th to uh, listen to the webinar that's going to be hosted by Jay Swank. Y'all have a good day.